the treasure of Sir Cloudsley Shovel. One August morning in 1967, two young skin divers from an English underwater treasure hunting expedition kicked themselves down into the dangerous depths around the reefs of the Skilly Isles off the tip of the Cornish coast. Throughout the summer, the expedition had been working on the edge of the Gillstone Rocks, seeking the wreck of Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel's 96-gun flagship, the Association, which had founded there with all hands 260 years before. Pay chests and prize money worth nearly two million pounds were reputed to be on board the association when she and four other warships split their timbers on the fangs of the gillstones on the stormy night of October 22, 1707. But the old hulls had long since disintegrated and mingled with countless other wrecks scattered over the sea bottom by the currents. Some encrusted cannon, a handful of coins and some other relics were the total harvest until that morning when Jeff Upton and Doug Rao went down to explore a new stretch of the ocean floor. Suddenly the beam of Upton's powerful torch revealed a narrow black opening between two massive rocks. Cautiously he wriggled through to investigate. Ahead was a patch of clean white sand with fish darting through the water, and strewn over the sand as far as the torchlight penetrated were gold and silver coins. In the next six days, the divers brought up nearly 1,500 coins, English sovereigns and crowns, Spanish dollars, French Louis d'Or, the currencies of Portugal, Italy and Turkey. When, some months later, they recovered a piece of silver plate bearing the crest of Sir Cloudsley's shovel, they knew that the site of the association wreck had at last been identified beyond doubt. The search for the association treasure continued for years, for the main body of the wreck, long broken up by tides and currents, eluded every expedition into the perilous waters off the Skillies. But already relics worth at least £100,000 have been brought to light from one of the worst peacetime disasters in the history of the Royal Navy. Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel was Commander-in-Chief of the British Mediterranean Fleet, and he was at the height of his reputation when 2,000 men and a quarter of his squadron perished with him on the Gillstone Rocks. For 40 years he had fought the French, the Spanish and the Barbary pirates. He was Admiral Rook's second in command at the famous capture of the Spanish treasure fleet in Vigo Bay. In 1707, Shovel was grossly fat, jovial and a deep drinking sea dog of 57 whose carousals with his officers afloat and ashore were notorious all over the Mediterranean. He was also a strong family man, and the Admiralty occasionally commented acidly on the surprising number of his relatives who trod the quarter-decks of his squadron. In the flagship association alone was his wife's nephew, Edmund Lodes, and the chief officer, Sir John Narborough, was one of his stepsons. In September 1707, Shovel was ordered to bring 21 ships of his fleet back to England for refit, after one of his most successful enterprises in the Mediterranean. For two months he had been blockading the French port of Toulon, while England's ally, the Duke of Savoy, marched along the Riviera and tried to take the town by land. The Duke's campaign failed, but the French burned all their warships in the Toulon harbour to prevent their being captured if Shovel launched an assault by sea. For the moment, the French navy in the Mediterranean had virtually ceased to exist, and the Admiral could safely sail for England, leaving only a few patrolling cruisers. It was October 21st when the English fleet approached the entrance to the Channel to begin its run up to Portsmouth. For days the weather had been foul, the ships wallowing in tremendous seas as a gale roared out of the Atlantic and blotted out sea and sky in torrential rainstorms. Next day, believing that he was nearing the outlying Skilly Isles, Shovel ordered all his captains to begin taking soundings while the association moved to the head of the line. Stretching for ten miles southwest of the main Skilly Isles was the most fearsome graveyard of the British coast. No one could estimate the number of ships lost over the centuries in the awesome maze of rocks and half-submerged reefs around which the currents boiled in never-ending fury. Throughout the fateful day, Shovel's fleet groped its way forward in rain and high wind, the officers seeking vainly for a glimpse of the lighthouse on St Agnes Isle. Then, in the gathering dusk, the association ran on the razor-like edge of the Gillstone Rocks. Within an hour, 2,000 seamen had perished in the disaster. 
Close behind, the flagship, the 96-gun St George, struck the reef, but miraculously contrived to shear off and get back into deep water, leaking from end to end. But somewhere in that horrifying nightmare of darkness and confusion, two other big ships of the line, the Romney and the Eagle, founded with every man on board. Two smaller vessels tried to seek safety by running north only to be swept away by the tide and dashed to pieces on the tiny, uninhabited island of Rosewear. Hearing the boom of signal guns from the flagship's deck, the rest of the fleet managed to bear away from disaster. For some time it was believed that the association might still be afloat. Two days later the truth emerged when fishermen were scouring the beaches off St Mary's Isle for any wreckage of value washed up from the sunken ships. On the sands of Portellic Cove they found the remains of one of the association's boats. Near it lay the naked bodies of Admiral Shovel and several of his crew. The corpses were buried above the beach until the Admiral's was later exhumed, taken to Portsmouth for embalming, and then finally laid with honour in Westminster Abbey. And then thirty years passed before an old fisherwoman made a deathbed confession to the horrified parson on the island of St Mary's. She had, in fact, been the first person to find the shipwrecked admiral as she trudged along the beach with her net shortly before the main search party arrived. Shovel was barely conscious but still breathing. She choked the life out of him with her hands so she could steal his fine clothes and his emerald ring. With this macabre epilogue, the tragedy of Sir Cloudsley Shovel and his lost ships went into history and joined the legends haunting the watery graveyard of the Skillies. Among the Cornish people, stories lingered on that the association was not just an ordinary naval vessel, but a treasure ship carrying the riches of a king's ransom. She was reputed to contain the pay chests of all the Mediterranean fleet, as well as masses of gold and silver taken as prizes from the enemy, and a private fortune which Shovel was bringing home to England. After the late 19th century, a few daring divers tried to explore the mysteries below the Gillstone Rocks, but it was impossible to penetrate deep into the deadly currents. No attempt was really feasible until the development of modern techniques of skin diving and underwater exploration after World War II. One of the most colourful personalities to launch a systematic search for the association treasure was Roland Morris, owner of a restaurant in the Cornish holiday town of Penzance. Morris was a veteran underwater man and for years after the war was employed by the Admiralty in cutting up dangerous wrecks along the coasts of Cornwall and Devon. In 1961 he formed a salvage company and paid the Admiralty ten pounds for the sole rights to the wreck of the naval frigate Anson, which founded in Mounts Bay in 1807. The Anson produced cannon and other relics, but Morris's imagination had been fired by the prospect of finding a much more famous ship, the Association of Admiral Shovel. For many years the exact spot where the association was lost had been debated by naval experts, and there seemed little hope that the mystery would ever be solved. Wrecks of wooden ships were known to break up rapidly in the turbulent waters of the Skillies, and the eddies carried their timbers far and wide over the ocean floor. Only the weightier objects, such as a warship's ponderous iron guns, cannonballs and pay chests, could be expected to settle close to where the ship reached bottom. In the 1960s, a Royal Navy team with experienced divers and heavy salvage gear began working in the maze of shoals around the edge of the Gillstone Rocks. They recovered barnacle-encrusted guns, anchors, utensils and other scraps of ironware, and early in 1967 it was announced that the relics almost certainly came from one of Admiral Shovel's wrecked ships. Of riches there was no sign, but this did not deter the treasure hunters, and soon several private expeditions had placed their headquarters on St Mary's Isle. The most ambitious was led by Roland Morris, and only weeks after his divers made their first descent, he was convinced that the association's last resting place had been found. In one place, the underwater explorers came across rows of cannon, so numerous that they named the stretch of seabed Cannon Gully, and this was only the threshold of their triumph. Gradually, the horde of relics mounted, including pewter plate, cups and pots, iron spikes, a bronze gun with 17th century Spanish markings, 
but a discouragingly small haul of coins. Then one morning Upton and Rao descended to extend their explorations farther along the perilous face where the gillstone rocks sloped jaggedly down to the ocean floor. Suddenly a dark fissure in the rocks opened up in the light of Upton's torch. He entered to investigate. Moments later he came back signalling excitedly to his companion to follow him. When the divers surfaced their nets were full of coins some single, but many cemented together by marine growth into almost indistinguishable lumps. For six days the divers went down until the treasure cavern was empty, while Roland Morris painstakingly cleaned the precious finds from the accumulation of 260 years. When the work was finished, nearly 1,500 coins gleamed in their natural gold and silver, the largest harvest of riches ever gathered from the wrecks of the Skilly Isles. Some experts still doubted whether Morris had really found the grave of Admiral Shovel's wreck. Then early in the following year came the clinching evidence. When the diving was resumed after the winter storms, the Morris party recovered a massive piece of silver plate that had obviously formed part of a rich dinner service. As it was cleaned, an engraved crest emerged from the encrustations. It was the memorial family crest of Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel.